couldn't get enough of that music. Hello, welcome to Textile Talks. I'm Amy Milne, uh, director of the Quilt Alliance and Happy New Year. Thank you for joining us as we kick off the 2024 season of programming for Textile Talks. We have another fantastic Quilters Save Our Stories interview to share with you today. Textile Talks is a weekly series, as many of you regulars know, uh, presented on Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern in partnership by the Quilt Alliance and our three partner organizations shown here. All Textile Talks are recorded and available via YouTube. So my colleague Emma Parker will enter that link for the Textile Talks uh, recording playlist in the chat now you can it's so nice to be able to watch these if you miss them in uh, live or if you want to re-watch them it's such a nice uh way that we've been able to archive this series uh if you're not familiar with the quilt alliance is this if this is the first uh of our programs that you've uh, been able to catch our mission is to document preserve and share the stories of all quilts and all quilt makers Today, we're going to present a demonstration of our longest running oral history project, Quilters Save Our Stories, or QSOS, which is a collection of oral history interviews with quilters archived with our partners at the Library of Congress and the University of Kentucky. QSOS was founded, was launched 25 years ago in 1999, and is not only the largest collection of interviews with quilters, but also the largest grassroots oral history project of its kind in the world. <clears throat> to find out more about the Quilt Alliance and the QSOS project, visit our website and consider being a member or a donor. We rely on this kind of community support to carry out our important mission. It's really a vital way to contribute. A quick reminder before we start, and I introduce uh, Susan and Teresa, a quick reminder just to use the Q&A box if you have questions for our speakers, the chat box for greetings to others, and the survey for commentary and ways we can improve. We have an enabled uh, the Zoom's closed captions feature. If you prefer not to view the captions, you should be able to turn them off by locating the CC or live captions button or going into your settings to do so. We are thrilled and honored to have our friend and colleague Susan Hudson here today to share her quilt story for inclusion in the QSOS collection. Susan lives in Sheep Springs, New Mexico on the Navajo reservation. She says in her bio, my mother taught me how to sew out of necessity. Since we were so poor, she couldn't afford to buy us clothes. She learned how to sew at Todlina Lena Boarding School. In order to be able to tell stories with my quilts, they have been able to evoke emotions in people and to speak for themselves. From the very first dream that I have been blessed with to sew it into reality to that very last stitch, I am able to convey the emotional impact that the quilt had on me to ensure that our ancestors' stories are never forgotten and to show that it has taken generations of native quilters to help me become the artist that I am. By taking quilting to another level, I have become a woman activist through quilting. It's beautiful. Our interviewer today, Teresa Durie Wong, is an author, lecturer, and quilt historian. She is the author of six nonfiction books on quilts and textiles. Her newest book, which includes Susan, a profile on Susan Hudson, is Sewing and Survival, <clears throat> Native American Quilts from 1880 to 2022. Teresa serves as a member of the Quilt Alliance Board, we're so lucky to have her, and is also a member of the International Advisory Board of the International Quilt Museum. She has been recognized as a scholar by the Visions Museum of Textile Art in San Diego and the Texas Quilt Museum. Teresa is a contributing writer for several publications, including Quilt Folk, Curated Quilts, 
Quilt Diary Japan, and others. She's also a quilt maker and an antique quilt collector. Her books cover Japanese quilts and textiles, American cotton, influential women leaders, social justice initiatives, and the new book, Quilt Folk Dogs, which Teresa wrote and curated. This QSOS interview is really a special one too because it marks the beginning of a new series of quilt documentation with communities of quilters who are currently underrepresented in the QSOS collection, including Native American quilters like Susan. So Susan is not only our interviewee today, but also a lead artist in this project. Teresa is not only today's interview, but will, she will also work on this project and has made a substantial philanthropic co contribution to support the project, providing a match for the National Endowment for the Arts grant funds that we received. So let me take this opportunity to thank the Teresa Durier and Jimmy Wong Family Foundation for this generous contribution. We are so thrilled and proud. And we can't can't wait to share more about this project um, as, as it rolls out. Really pleased to start it with this interview. After the interview, you will have time for a brief Q&A with Susan, so please go ahead and enter your questions as they come to you in the Q&A box. So I'll ask, I'm going to turn my screen sharing off and ask that um, Teresa and Susan join me and turn their uh, cameras on and their mics on. Hello, welcome to you both. Hello. I will turn okay. it over to you, Teresa, and Thank you. Uh, you can start your screen share whenever you're ready. Thank you both. Thank you so much, Amy. We really appreciate that information, that uh, nice introduction and all the information about the project. Susan, hello. How are you? Gate. I'm doing good. How are you? Good. Do you want to say hello to everyone? Oh, okay. I'm from Tohotsoi in uh, the Great Navajo Nation. I belong to the um, uh, Kiani. My clan is Kiani, and uh, I belong to the Great Navajo Nation. I uh, want to, um, before I forget, trigger warning. Uh, I need to say that because your mental health is important to me, uh, how you process what I'm going to say, because I will be talking uh, about things that are uncomfortable, but they need to be said. So I wanted to do that. And I understand if you don't want to watch me anymore, and that's okay. <laughs> All right. But I appreciate y'all. I'm like, wow. I, yeah. yeah, I am so glad you said that because uh, we really appreciate the fact that you, as I've written about you, you don't you don't sugarcoat your messages. So um, it's good. You're honest and transparent and it's um, part of your story we all need to hear. So you mentioned a couple of times that um, you're um, coming to us from the Navajo Nation. Can you just describe where you are and maybe tell us a little bit about the Navajo Nation and your community there? And um, what is it like? We have people from all over the country and even some international viewers as well. Well, I look at reservations uh, when the colonizers came and they uh, they formed their own government. And so I look at reservations like, uh, like prisoner war camps. Uh, where I'm at, uh, up in the mountains, uh, we usually have like uh, down below, like in the desert, and then we have like sheep camp up on top of the uh, mountains. And it's not because we're rich or anything that we have two whole guns or cabins or whatever. It's out of necessity to live and to provide for ourselves to, within the winter because nobody wants to be up in the mountains when it's snowing. So they come back and down below, and then in the summer uh, summertime they start to take them up because it's a lot cooler and uh, there's a lot more vegetation than there is out in the desert. And, uh, and you know, we're blessed. I'm blessed to be able to live between uh, two, um, the, two, the four sacred mountains. Uh, you know, uh, I believe in the creation stories when the, um, the Dene and uh, they, uh, the holy people, when they, you know, created us. And uh, so I live within that four sacred mountains and I, there is no way to really describe what it looks like because it changes every day, you know, whether it's cloudy 
uh, or storming, snowing, raining, a hot day where you're out there sweating, you know, you your little tans, you know, going on, or you're picked up by mosquitoes. So everything is different. And uh, we have a lot of places that still don't have running water or indoor plumbing. So when we go up to the sheep camp, we have to uh, haul water and uh, outhouses. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, while we talk, Susan, I'm going to um, share my screen here and we're going to look at some of Susan's quilts. Just bear with me one moment, I'll get this going. So um, to give us something to look at while we're talking, I have just a collection of um, quilts um, that Sue's amazing, incredible uh, quilts are really story quilts and they're beautiful cultural treasures. Um, Susan often highlights um, her Navajo heritage, uh, both the pain and joys and sorrow of her family history and future. So um, let's, Let's just uh, sort of maybe set the scene, Susan, how would you describe your aesthetic um, to people and how, you know, how do you decide which quilt, uh, which stories that you will tell uh, through your artistry and your quilt making? Um, I'm a, I'm cons I consider myself a contemporary ledger artist. Uh, when you look at ledger arts that people don't know what it is, uh, they have a lot of records where a lot of the Plains Indians were taken to like Fort Marion in uh, Georgia. And when you take away your our way of life and stuff, we adapt. And one of the ways they did is there are ledger books all over. If you had uh, a trader or, you know, someone in the trader po trading post or, you know, the, the military or the government there, there are ledger books around. So what you do is you take them and you draw on them. So Senator Ben Horse Campbell, uh, I would make his quilts for his giveaway. So we were having a discussion about that, uh, quilts and, you know, he was telling me it was boring. So uh, we talked about um, what I can do to get myself out of the box. And so we talked about, and I got to uh, um, talk about ledger art to how much I appreciate, because I cannot draw I can't, I cannot paint, I can sew. Uh, and so uh, I put them together and that's what I do as I was, but I can also you consider, explain what ledger art means. I'm not sure everyone is uh, familiar with that, but it's sort of based on paper that was available, right? Um, yes, ledgers. Uh, yeah. Relocation, which would be old used ledgers, right? Well, no, this is not from the relocations. This is the, from the beginning of time when the colonizers came because there were ledger books all over the place, even back east when, uh, they, you know, you take away somebody's life, their way of life, then you, we adapt. It's just like us as quilters, we adapt because when I was growing up, we had those big shears. Now they got these wonderful, shear, you know, scissors uh, and they got, you know, rotary cutters that we never had. So we have to learn us, uh, you know, me, I had to learn how to adapt to use those. So that's what ledger was, you know, I mean, it, or I can explain it another way. It's like, oh, uh, when we're little, your kids, your grandkids, your niece, nephew, you, even yourselves, you would draw on a wall. The thing about the ledger art was the paper with the lines, it was accounting paper. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but I always said we all did our own ledger art because I know when I was little, we were so dirt poor that we would go outside and in the dirt there, we would draw. I mean, I don't know how to draw, but you know, when you're little, you just stick people. I'm a gold medalist in stick people pe drawing. I can tell you that. <laughs> so the lines, uh, the vertical lines in this quilt that we're looking at are representative of ledger art with your hand. Uh, yeah. 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 Of uh yeah, ledger paper, uh, county paper, they would yeah. say so. Yeah, yeah, that's what ledger art is. Yeah. And so talk a little bit about uh both your mother and your grandmother and many other of your uh uncles and relatives um were forced to attend um off reservation or reservation boarding schools there. Um talk a little bit about the impact of that. And this is where many of them um, where your mother learned sewing and um, the stories that she sort of passed on to you. Could you talk a little bit about that? Uh, it starts, you know, I'm a, I, my, all my quilts have long stories. And so it started before the long walk in the 1860s, um, the trauma that these children had being on the force on the long walk, you know, being on um, the army and the uh, government didn't care about us, the army soldiers, 
looked at as a, uh, a way of money. So they were selling to the slavers that were, uh, and the slavers were sanctioned by the Catholic Church. And then a lot of them uh, uh, were taken over there to Albuquerque or you know along the way into Mexico City. And so you talk about these children that are traumatized going through that. And then they get all the way left. And then, you know, the stuff that the four years that the starvation, the disease and everything, and then um, being um, preyed upon by predators, you know, pedophiles. And the, um, the soldiers, once again, were um, having cribs there, you know, so, um, prostitution, you know, you, like right here, you'll see like the soldiers would go out there and have a can of food because the young ones that first got there, you know, were um, dying from syphilis, you know, um, STDs, so they were dying, and so then you know pedophiles they preyed on the children, and so I'm going to ask you guys to think about this. You have put yourself in their place. You have children. You're starving. You know what do you do, knowing that a soldier is going to come out there with a can of food and then pick a child, and knowing that once he gives that child that can of food, okay, so you send your child over there, knowing that that child is going to be raped knowing chances of pregnancy, but then you're gonna get that can of food to eat. So there's decisions that you have to make in life. So um, those children went through that. And then when they signed the treaty and in the treaty says the children have to go to school. So then you got the trauma going all the way from there, going back home and all the stuff that's happening at home that maybe you don't have a place to live because your sheep camp was taken over, you know, or you know, you got brothers and sisters that were white, black, Mexican, whatever, you know, the mom was bringing them back and then you're ostracized. Then they send you to the school and then you get traumatized there. So it was intergenerational trauma, 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 trauma. So when my, my grandma and my mom went to school, what they did was they didn't teach them, you know, the basics like of, you know, um, science or anything. They taught them to be servants. My mom always said that. She always said that. She always wonders what she would have been if she hadn't gone to, you know, the boarding school, if she had gone to a regular school to get the education she needs to have a better life. So she, we all became trapped in all of this, even myself, being all trapped into all this um, trauma and everything. So when you're really dirt poor and everything, you don't have a lot of clothes. And sometimes people would feel sorry for us and would give um, my mom clothes. And so she taught me how to do uh, alterations. They call it alterations now. And it was like, hey, let's make it a little bigger so it fits. Uh, so you have all the trauma and, you know, with them being forced to sew like that. So how my mom taught me to sew was the same way she was taught. And when my mom, was, when I got older and stuff and I would say, mom, why did you hit me? And I had made the decision you know, after, you know, the whippings I would get if the, you know, the stitches weren't right and everything, I did not want to teach my children or my grandchildren. So I off, I told them if they want to learn how to sew, I will pay for the classes. I cannot teach. I don't really like giving classes. I'll give them, but, you know, I really don't like doing it. So, you know, that's, so that's a little bit of trauma of what my ancestors, my mom, my grandma, my mom went through. So I can be here to um, talk about my quotes and to tell the stories for that heartbreak or what they have done for me. Definitely. And your mom was surprised, I think, and your grandmother also, right, that you chose to take up quilting um, because the sewing for them had such painful memories. Uh, yeah, that was, it was, uh, they knew that I would sew for survival because I had children to take care of, you know, when you have kids, you know, the problem with them is they like to grow and they like to eat and they get big feet, you know. <laughs> you know, when they're little, you got them grandibles and, you know, hey, or whatever you could afford, you put on them and they didn't complain. And as got older, you know, they didn't like that anymore. So I always tell my, my now I even tell my grandkids now, you know what, you're not so bad to be around, but you know what, this guy just want to eat all the time, you know. So I had to do something to, um, uh, to survive. And that's what I did. I would make shawls and, uh, and I would make quilts, start quilts. I can make, I knew I can make them and make money, but 
there in those days, uh, we didn't have a lot of places to shop. You know, uh, you know, and then when we did have places, you know, it was a cheap material. Mm. And so when, um, uh, when I, after I talked with Ben and everything, he told me about the Herd uh, Museum. So I applied there and they accepted me and my first quilt I won and I was like kind of shocked. And then uh, Cowboys and Indian Magazine came around and I didn't know who they were. So I had my kids investigate and they told me, oh, Ben's in there. So when I told Ben, he's going, free advertisement, do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I did it and I uh, ended up being best of the West. That's and, awesome. And, and, yeah, it was best of the West. And um, they had Johnny Depp there. I guess he was a uh, little ranger or something like that. And um, we're going to talk about was, that uh, quilt too in just a minute. <laughs> yeah. You put really powerful messages um, in all of your quilts, um, very much a storyteller. And as you said at the beginning, some of them are, um, you know, painful messages. This is one of your story quilts that we're looking at. It's called Missing Murdered Indigenous Women Since 1492. It is part now of the International Quilt Museum Collection. So can you talk a little bit about maybe this quilt, but also just in general, how do you choose which story you want to tell? My show quilts take about 18 months to make. Uh, I really don't choose them. Oh, matter of fact, I don't choose them. I had dreams. I start dreaming uh, and then, you know, pictures come in front of me and I always say they're like a little filing system. Uh, one's delete and the other one is save. And I'll delete, delete ones go away. And then the ones that are saved, I mean, I can be sitting here like right now and I'll just start seeing pictures. I'll start seeing that or I'll dream about them. And then when it comes down to about four pictures, um, then I'll start dreaming. And when I start getting those dreams, it's the ones that make me cry. The ones that four times that I'll sit up and start crying uh, because there I will hear um, the crying, you know, um, the verbal abuse, the emotional abuse, you know, I, the, the rapes, uh, you know, the, and it's, it's really traumatic and it's kind of like, can't wake up until I finish it, you know, then it start smelling the sweat, the blood, uh, and then all of a sudden that picture will be right there and that's what I know I'm going to make and it takes me a long time to gather fabric uh, and then try to figure out how I'm going to do this because, you know, I try to do little sketches but like I said, I'm bad at drawing. So I do my little stick people <laughs> and um, it starts coming together. It takes me a long time and, you know, choosing fabrics and everything. Uh, and, but it does come together. And when I get to a point where I cannot go any farther because I'm not sure what's supposed to go, I'll put it to the side and then I'll pray, pray about it. Either uh, something will, um, Tell me this is the way it has to be. This is the way it's going to be. Or uh, this is how you put it, uh, you know, move the pieces around. Uh, so uh, it's it's them, it's my my spirit helpers. You know, they uh, to and uh Wakans the net. So they they help me out, and that's where I start doing it. And it's it's uh it's it's something that I really can't explain a lot of the, the process because that's me and the, uh, between my uh, spirit helpers, the quilt makers, my ancestors, and um, yeah, yeah. And tell us about um, this particular quilt. Um, you know, explain what you're trying to tell here with the missing, murdered um, Indigenous women and this tiny, tiny. Um, pieces of clothing that you've recreated here, and just so everyone knows, these blocks that you're looking at, they're about probably about five inches or so, right? So it's really miniature. And the detail I, is just incredible. I, uh, when I started seeing the dreams, I started seeing all this. And so I, I know this is going to be kind of sensitive to a lot of people because, you know, uh, as we go through life, you know, we have people that are, um, have died through, um, through all our lives. Uh, and one of the things is, um, depends on what kind of closet you have. Um, you know, we had a, uh, up in the sheep camp and stuff, they would put a nail there and you just put your clothes on there. Um, we didn't have closets because, you know, when you're in a hogan or a, a log cabin, you don't have the room for that. I wanted this to look at like the closet. You can open the door up 
and see clothes there. Those clothes are a reminder of that person that's no longer here. The smell of the clothes, the uh, memories of that clothes. It's the clothes in there that are waiting for that young girl to come back to put the clothes on so they can make more memories. And so I decided to make all the pieces, you know, there's four of them for the four directions. Um, and two of them are made old style and two are made younger styles. And I had my grandkids help me with this one, had them sewing. So as they sit there with me and they know the stories, you know, they, I had to sit down and explain to them about what rape was, you know, pedophiles. I had to explain everything to them. People got upset. And I said, why it's happening in the world. Why not have them tell the stories of our families? And so I would explain, you know, the, uh, the different type of clothing. I would explain, you know, um, like the one with the buckskin dress, it's not fully done is because he had disappeared. It was taken before the dress was made and to show that they're human beings, that somebody loved them, that some, you know, an aunt, a grandma, a mom would brush their hair, or, you know, make, you know, a brother or father would go out there and do the hunting for the, the leather. So I wanted them people to see we are human beings. We're not trash. We're not something that you can just do. And then, you know, you can do whatever you do to the young girls and then kill them and then dispose of the bodies like nothing. And the government allows that. So I wanted to bring attention to what was going on in our world. That, you know, um, where we live in fear, it's kind of like, um, what did the girls say? Um, you know, what do we do if we're raped? But they say, what do we do when we're raped? What do we do when someone tries to kidnap us and then put us in, um, you know, um, prostitution, you know, drug them up. So this is what I did. I wanted to bring awareness to that and kind of that shock value of this is what's happening in your, your own home, in your backyard or wherever. We're not invisible. We're here. We have family. We're humans. So that's what I did. And I had my grandkids help me with that. That must have been a really powerful experience for your grandchildren as well. Yes, it's something that they know in the stories. And that, that was really um, something that when I'm no longer here and my grandkids can go up and take their, their grandchildren to see the quilts and they know the story. And that's our story. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's our story. Mm -hmm. And then you also... Um... We, uh, when you decided to give this particular quilt to the International Quilt Museum, you had um, a sort of a, a small giveaway ceremony. Do you want to talk a little bit about, um, about that? What we're looking at here is that quilt is um, stored flat in the archives of the International Quilt Museum. And um, do you just want to share maybe a little bit about that? Uh, yes, that was, that was a real kicker for me because uh, I, when I make the quilts, I have a connection with the quilts, but the quilts decide where they're gonna go. And it had been uh, at the Idle George Museum in uh, Indianapolis. And so they shipped it over to the International Quilt Museum. So I didn't have anything in between. And I wasn't, I was not expecting, you know, for the offer to come through. And so I was still connected to the quilt. And what I needed to do was to um, hand it over. So the quilt belonged over there. It still didn't have that attachment to me. And so that's why I had asked if I can go over there and do what I needed to do for myself and for the quilt. And um, it was, it was, you know, when it, it was pretty cool. And I was really uh, appreciated that when I went over and said my prayers and everything. And I had, because once I do that, I can't touch it anymore. Once I touch the mother earth and stuff, I give it to somebody that's, you know, in the middle of that, which was you. And then, you know, you know, and I hugged it and I talked with it and, you know, the tree was right there. And then I handed it over to you. And then slowly that bond would go over. And then when you handed it over, then it was done. It belongs to you. Yeah. 
That was I, a, I do that with my quilts. Yeah. yeah. That was a beautiful moment. You talked to your quilts. Yes. They I talked talk to them because mm -hmm. uh, they have life. It's, it's life. It's uh, stories. Mm -hmm. It's um, something that maybe a lot of people out there that aren't Navajo or maybe from another tribe or someplace else that they can look at and they can relate. We all have those stories in our life. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that um, people understood what I was doing. And um, it was um, especially with the, between the quilt and I, because like I said, it's the spirit helpers, anybody helped me do that. And the, um, the quilts have spirits with them. Uh, and that's what I wanted to do was to let it go and go where the home that it chose. And it really, I mean, I think this is an aesthetic that is so unique to you, Susan. This really comes through in your art because you're putting your heart and your soul and your history and, you know, the memories and of your family and your, um, you know, your hopes for the future. I think we can see all of these things um, in your art. Such a beautiful, really treasures that you're creating and sharing with all of us. And I think as viewers, um, we learn a lot. Um, through your art and um, appreciate, um, I think, get a better appreciation of um, the story that you're sharing with us. Okay, I appreciate that. And then this is another quilt. Um, this is one that is part of the Smithsonian uh, National Museum of the American Indian and um, very much telling a story here. Do you, uh, I want you to walk us through this story, but also I want to point out, so what you're looking at on this particular slide is the front and back of this particular quilt. And um, on the back, um, photographed here with the back are some of the ribbons. Susan is, um, you know, so many awards that that she has won. Uh, when she finishes her art quilts, they're just immediately snapped up by museums or collectors. Um, but this is one of your first uh, big um, awards, I think that you're super proud of. Do you wanna talk a little bit about this one? This one, everybody calls the tears. It's called Tears for Your Children, Tears of Our Children. And I wanted to uh, honor my ancestors. Well, mostly a bit emotional. Um, yeah. Honor my mother. And um, I wanted to show uh, that how the government came in, the missionary schools, the government schools, uh, all the schools, the boarding schools that the kids went to, that we had these beautiful clothes. We have, we're, we're beautiful. We, you know, we have all these clothes and, you know, and there's a meat behind a lot of them. And then when they went to these schools and stuff, they just destroyed, you know, the genocide that happened uh, when they uh, put us, I call them the little house in the prairie clothes because they were butt ugly, you know? <laughs> Uh, they put them in the uniforms and stuff. And so if you, you look at some of the pictures that they have out, you know, they show the boarding school, you know, you're seeing what the hair chopped down in their uh, clothes. But what you need to do is look in their eyes. If you know, after this, look up, look a picture, look up pictures, look in their eyes. They tell a story. So I wanted to show that, you know, all uh, right, you know, some of them with uh, the girls with the uh, little ribbons. My grandmother would tell you when she went to the boarding school, they um, chopped the hair down. They would, um, and, you know, uh, then they would, during the time they wanted them to have those curls like um, like um, Shirley Temple. And, you know, our hair doesn't curl like that. And they would, she said that they would have the rags in there to have the curls and it wouldn't work. So what they would do, the matrons would do was get mad, grab the, that um, rag curl and cut it and then sometimes be cutting their um, skin they would be bleeding but they would get a little pieces of those um, rags and then make little, like little bows so they would they wanted to be beautiful in it uh, and then I show with a little boy where his holding his braids where they cut his braids because uh, in our ways if you cut your hair like that that means somebody has died now when they took their his braids like that that he thought his whole family died. You know, it was really, really traumatic. And then, then I showed on the bottom, you know, this represents my, um, some of my family members, uh, uh, Senator Nighthorse, his, his um, grandmas that survived the San Cree massacre. And uh, 
well, a lady, Gina, her mom, who survived the uh, um, boarding schools, uh, the traumatic, you know, the agony that she went through, and then our holy people. But the one on the bottom is I have a lot of, um, you probably can't see it too good, as outlines of the spirits. And so uh, if you look at there, there's a wagon and there's a little girl there that's to represent my mom. And then the soldiers keeping the women back because they would shoot the parents when they would try to get their children. But um, what it is, is I mess around with the wheels and then with the flag and everything. I know people get upset with me, but on the wagon, those aren't wheels. Those are handcuffs. They would make little handcuffs for these children. I mean, why would you put a handcuff on a little four-year-old or five-year-old? And so this was to represent my mom being in the wagon, being taken away, but the kids that went before her and the kids that would go after. So this was my tribute to them, you know, yeah. Yeah, it's a really beautiful tribute. And um, also you're, you know, re sort of recreating clothing um, in miniature here. These are, um, you know, very small figures and the intricate details that you've put on all of these with the beads and the braids um, and the pieces of leather. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? That must be so difficult to work. It's so small like that. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's one of those where I was like, I didn't know what I was doing. Well, I tell you what, I'm really good at French knots. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> I'm really good. Uh, well, I, I grew up the Cheyenne way, so I'm able to do a lot of this. Uh, in, well, besides, and then with Ben, you know, being Cheyenne too. So I, uh, I always tell the beaters, because on his little vest, I did some beadwork on there. It took me six hours to do that. Oh, my God. I'm like, I can't bead. Uh, so I always tell the beaters, I hey, I'm not competition, but it was something that I needed to do, and I wanted to make it in the old style, the old style of clothing. Uh, it's not the new style because I want to show how beautiful our clothes are. Even though in the Navajos that you see them, I got the one, the lady in purple. That's what they use now, but that's actually not what we used to use in the old days. Uh, how we to dress. This is uh, something that picked up with the um, uh, what are the the army wives. If you look at some of their clothes, uh, the skirts uh, and the velvet, and all of a sudden, I don't know who it is. All of a sudden, you know, velvet. You know, somebody that could trade for velvet made a shirt, and, and uh, so there's a lot of stories of how we got our clothing. But uh, I just want to show we were more beautiful than the ugly little house in the Yes, definitely. Which would, you're talking about the top panel, which is this yes. really yes. brown clothing that the depressing, just like yeah. them. Yeah, 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 yeah. And this is um, uh, a real and an even more close up of those French knots that you love so much, which are so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, the so, French knots. Yeah, because uh, the what they did, uh, they used to have the elk teeth, and they would. Um, you know, generation after generation, and elk only had, you know, uh, each one only had a set. So you had to be a great hunter in uh, order to have a um, a dress like this. Yeah. I did the French knots and I did the uh, leather, and then I uh, found some fabric and then made them into an eagle fan. Yeah. And this is a close up showing the uh, wagon wheels, which are actually handcuffs, handcuffs, as Susan just described. And then this is a video I really want to show you guys. So I uh, was able to go into the archives of the uh, Smithsonian uh, National Museum of the American Indian, where I, st I saw Susan's quilt in person, along with other quilts from a, uh, another collection. And so these are um, some of the collection managers, and they are carefully... Um, wrapping Susan's quilt back up. And I always think it's also, it's always interesting to watch how people store uh, quilts, but all of the quilts there are rolled. And um, these women were very meticulous, doing a really uh, careful job of caring for 
um, this precious quilt. And I spent the whole day there and um, so many people were so interested that some quilt lady came to see quilts. And so people were coming in all day and this particular quilt had quite a crowd um, around it earlier in the day. So um, it was a real treat. And again, this is the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. Um, their collections archive staffs are kind of on the outskirts of Washington, DC. Um, so that was um, that was a real treat. So Susan, let's talk a little bit more um, about um, your heritage. And not only are you telling kind of the um, painful parts of your history, but I think you also are trying to capture um, a little bit about your future. Um, and so you do focus a lot on the children. And um, do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, how you're trying to capture those stories for future generations? In, in my thought process, you know, like I said before, that um, we have our own creation stories. And we had changing woman and you know the prayers that started from there and that the prayers from the beginning of time when our Kiaanis, because we're one of the four um major clans, that those women got up every morning and they put down their tadadin and they prayed not only for them but for the future. And I'm part of that future. When they went to uh what they they did the same thing, no matter how much they suffered and everything, they said the prayers for us. And uh, when I say my prayers, I pray for my ancestors, thanking them for surviving, because if they did not survive all that they went through, I would not be here. And I thank, you know, and I pray because my mother, you know, um, chose me to be into her life. And so then I pray for my children because they're doing great things. and. Um, there were not that statistics were, you know, edu highly educated. Our family's highly ed or well, my family, my, my kids are highly educated. And then I sit down and I talk with my grandkids and I involved them with this because that is their history. That is their story. And nobody, nobody in this world is gonna take it away. And when the uh, elders would talk about, we can't talk about this because, you know, bad stuff comes and they, they were silenced by my, my chase, their co talk but they couldn't talk about it. Well, I'm going to talk about it and nobody's going to freaking stop me because I'm going to stand up there and I don't care. I'm going to be the activist because these quilts are going to last way beyond my lifetime, hundreds of years from now because they'll be taken care of. This is more important than me going out there wearing a pink hat, you know. Um, going out there and, you know, protesting. Yeah. Uh, this means more. This is going to last more because no one's going to remember that I was there, but they'll remember. Millions of people are going to see their stories and they're and they're important to me. Especially very, very so, so me. many of your quilts are in such, you know, uh, esteemed museums around the country too. Definitely will be preserved for all time. Oh, yeah. So let's uh, switch gears a little bit. You are involved in a really great project. Uh, so I did want to talk just about that real quickly, the Navajo Quilt Project. And this is a partnership uh, with French General. So there's lots of information on the French General um, website. And do you want to talk a little bit about this particular project? And we'll show a few photos, too, of some of the uh, people in your community that you're working with. Oh, I would be so happy to do that. But you know what, Kari, I know you're listening. Thank you. Um, you don't know how much it means to me, to all the people that are out there that have donated fabric because I have grandmas that cannot afford fabric. They can't, you know, if you're up in the cheap camera stuff, you can't afford to, uh, you know, go down, you know, go to town, which is 80 miles away to go buy fabrics. And all the people with their generous hearts that donate all this fabric and not only it uh, keeps them warm, um, we get we get to check up on them. We get to interact with them. Um, they get to sew. They get to tell stories. They involve their children, their grandchildren. Uh, you know, telling stories, laughing, just getting along with each other. You know, and you know, math score for these kids have gone up because you know they have to learn quarter inch, five eighths of an inch, whatever. You know, seven, seventh eighth inch kills me. Just put an inch. You know, when you're making blocks. <laughs> You know, yeah. angles, you know, their, their vast scores have gone up uh, enough to, um, 
you know, the chapter house, sheet screens. This is my chapter right here, sheet screens right here. What they've done is they have started a sewing, uh, sewing circle where they make um, things for the elders. They get uh, the fabric from the devil that are donated. Uh, they make all these um, quilts. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, just before Christmas in the chapter house, they went in, uh, got all these um, tables and sewing machines together and they made um, uh, was a Christmas stockings. Well, the teenagers that don't want to yeah. do any, they were there, you know, making Christmas presents and stuff. And, you know, it goes all over the reservation. You know, uh, I've got people all over uh, that help out, you know, and with the yarn and, you know, the yarn that's donated goes to some of our ceremonies. In, in a lot of them, we, especially yeah. in the wintertime, we have, you know, the enemy, enemy way ceremony. We have the uh, Yepiches. And you know the Yepiches are nine days. So what they do is they get that uh, fabric and they give it out. And to whoever donates, they get those blessings. You guys don't know it, but from our in our way, you get those blessings, and you know it's really good. And I really, really yeah. appreciate it. So this slide is some of the addresses, um, and we're going to link this on the um, from the textile talks. I know there's a lot of information to get on the screen, um, but maybe you can just easily remember the Stitch a Quilt store in Durango. Uh, they're one of the uh, another sponsor partner with this, along with Kari at French General. So you can also that you can send donations in a fabric. Um, yarn, um, machines even, and um, you can definitely call and uh, get some more information or go on the French General website. So that's a really great project if you're interested in helping um, support the Navajo Quilt Project. And um, lastly, I just want to say there, um, I do have a book that came out um, earlier this year, and this is a, a comprehensive book on the history of Native American quilting um, for about the last 150 years or so. And Susan is featured um, in this book, so you can definitely see all of her quilts that uh, mostly that we've shown today, um, and her story is captured here um, as well. And um, if you go to my website, if anyone's interested, you can use the code textile talk uh, for a discount, 20% uh, off and free shipping. Also, I donate uh, $4 of every book sold to the American Indian College Fund. And um, just at year end was able to wrap up um, a, a nice donation for them from all of the books that have been sold so far. So thank you to everyone um, that has already uh, purchased a book. So I'm super excited, Susan, to have been able to present this uh, textile talk with you. You're so amazing and you're so uh, generous with your time and talent and sharing all of your stories with us. And we just so much appreciate it. And um, so I guess I'll turn it back to Amy if they want to go through uh, questions or comments that um, we have in the, the Q&A. Teresa, I'll let you look through the Q&A and pick ones you'd like. I think we've got a bunch of questions. Susan, okay. thank you so much as always for for your candor and your um, you know you're so eloquent in the way that you tell your story, and um, we all need to hear it. So don't ever stop um, telling your story for yeah. our community. So we have lots of questions. So a simple one, I think you can answer quickly is um, when we were looking at the ledger quilt uh, with the horses on it. They're asking, are these appliqued or painted? Applique. I you can't paint, paint, remember? Yeah. <laughs> <Applique>. <laughs> no painting. So <laughs> another question is, um, I'm not sure that all of our viewers understand, you know, the different cultures and the different um, painful parts of history that different um, tribes went through and nations. So someone, uh, we've got a question, um, an anonymous question. Can you describe the difference between the Long Walk and the Trail of Tears? Trail of Tears was the Cherokee, Choctaws, you know, the seven nations over there. I think there were seven nations. And uh, Long Walk of the Navajos was when Kit Carson came in, the government, and they uh, wanted to take us actually to Oklahoma. We're one of the few tribes that came back to our uh, our sacred lands. Yeah. Yeah. Uh and um, so many of those stories, and there's so many amazing books that you can go out um, and read about um, all that different history. And um, 
you know, uh, it's just a lot of information out there. We have another question about when your mother and your grandmother were forced to sew. Can you just describe like who were they sewing for and what what were they sewing? They were uh, sewing a lot of the uniforms, you know, because the kids, they needed the uniforms and, and they were sewing quilts. And uh, I've always wondered why, because when you look at the pictures in the boarding schools, they have the army blankets. So I always said, well, where are the quilts at? So I figured that whoever institute that they were in were selling the quilts off and, you know, not giving it back to the kids, you know, or feeding them properly or medicine or anything like that. It, it just, it was horrible. So it's like, what happened to the quilts? But that's what I think happened. Yeah. Mm. So there's a question here about language and, um, Language is one of the first things, this is the question I'm reading, that were stripped away by the colonizers um, and in my community, enslavers. Have you made quilts that do not include English, but instead feature the Navajo language? Oh, yeah, I have one. It's called Ake Shema Do Shinche. That one I sold uh, at, the, I, at the herd. So if you want to buy one of my quilts, you got to be at the herd because that's where I usually sell them real quick. I sold that one in uh after i hung it up in 10 minutes yeah that was in so and she's talking about the herd museum of uh american indian art in phoenix um arizona and um there's a series of indian markets that sort of go across the country um mostly through the spring and summer and the herd is kind of the first one right that sort of kicks off that series so when Susan works for a year or 18 months on one particular quilt, she debuts it at the Indian market at the Herd Museum. So that's why she's saying go, go to the Indian market at the Herd. It's in March um, and you can be first in line to get one of Susan's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got private collectors. At, uh, uh, that one that I sold there was like 10 minutes. So that was the fastest. But the uh, last one was at the uh, Santa Fe. And I sold that before, right when it opened. Yes. And in 2022, um, I came to see you at the Santa Fe Indian Market, which was the 100th anniversary of that particular market, which is really just astounding. Um, and it's a, a really beautiful uh, market and so much art to absorb and take in. So another person um, says that you have touched our heart. And um, another person says, can we get a Canadian quilt shop to carry Teresa's book? <laughs> We're gonna work on that. That's a really good one. Um, what, and here's another program. What, pro, what programs are available on the reservation for learning to sew? And is there a need for basic sewing machines? Uh, yes, there is a need for basic sewing machines. If you look on a uh, line, it goes to French General, you'll see my studio. I have a studio in, in Colorado. Um, because uh, all the sewing machines should be coming to me because I know where they go because a lot of times um, people are really nice they send these sewing machines but a lot of times my grandmas don't have electricity so I have a really cool couple in St. Louis that come out and bring the uh, channel sewing, sewing machines. I, they're beautiful but I'm traumatized for them because uh, when I was little my great grandma had or still around had one and we used to play with it and then one day she kept telling us to do that. And we didn't realize she was sewing while we were messing around with it. Then we wanted to get up and we got a double for that. So trundle sewing machines have traumatized me. <laughs> <laughs> what? And here's another question. Um, it's kind of a long question, but I know we're running out of time. So I'm just kind of paraphrase. What okay. do you need most for the Navajo Quilt Project? How can people help you the most? Oh, fabric. One thing, the number one thing is fabric. Uh, and batting yeah and yarn. fabric and batting so and people yarn. can go on the French General website and find the Navajo Quilt Project and all the addresses plus we're going to have a link uh, to those addresses um, with this textile talk um, and Emma's just put that uh, link to the Navajo um, Quilt Project on the French General site and um, you can mail boxes of fabric directly to Susan and other people in her community, as well as the quilt shop um, in Durango. Um, yes, uh, in uh, the uh, Stitch Quilt Shop in Durango, uh, people have, you know, uh, bought sewing machines from them and or added to um, buy a gift certificate. So if there's a need, we can go in there and buy something. Oh, that's perfect. Yes, yeah. it's and much easier than shipping fabric. <laughs> yeah, the end of marker. Super, super cool. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, this is really great. I'm just so excited to, uh, such an honor to interview you today, Susan, and really appreciate your time. And uh, thank you to everyone who's listening um, to this textile talk. And um, I'll turn it back over to Amy um, to wrap it up. Thank you both so much. What an incredible start to the Textile Talks New Year. That was a fantastic talk, and I hope that many, many more people will be able to access it via the recording. That's such a nice way to um, also those who watched it today. I saw someone say, I'm going to rewatch this. I just want to remind everyone that the Quilt Alliance is a membership organization, and we have a new uh, brand new start to the year. So we're going to have an open house on January 10th. So if you're a QA member, just check your inbox later this week for a reminder. And if not, it's a great time to join. Uh, you can join on our website for as little as $30. Also coming up is the start to the uh, season four of Running Stitch, a QSOS podcast, which draws from QSOS interviews like this. There are over 1,200 in the collection. So it draws excerpts, invites back guests uh, who've already been interviewed and new guests. And Yannickin Smucker is the host of our podcast. Wonderful. Coming up on January 16th is the next one. And I want to mention too, next week's Textile Talk will be Cindy Grisdella, Abstractions in Color at the Virginia Quilt Museum. That's presented by Sakwa. That sounds like it's going to be great. And you can find the link to register on all the partner organizations' websites. Uh, and of course, registration is free. Thanks to our sponsors and our donors. And you can make an individual donation to Texel Talks if you're so moved. Um, Emma can put the uh, link to the donations page if she would in our in our chat box, you can find it on the, the registration page for all the groups too. But thanks for being here today. I hope you are all have, a, have had a great start to the new year and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.